everybody so welcome to another edition of knowledge graph technology showcase winter edition where i go through some of the cool tools and services that are out there so that you don't necessarily have to reach out to that salesperson unless you really want to all right and these are all my honest review these are not sponsored and if i miss something that you really want to see reviewed make sure you link it down below all right so i am here talking to some folks i.e al from Stardog. And this is something that I have seen cropping up in a lot of places. I actually experimented with Stardog a few years ago. So this will be a little bit new for me too, because I'm sure new things have come out since then. And Stardog is, by the way, one of the top contenders in the Forrester wave. So it's definitely something to check out. And I'm excited to see what you have in store for us, Al. So Al, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, so I'm Al Baker, Vice President of Enterprise Solutions at Stardog responsible for all the technical delivery on our various uh, contracts and engagements. Yeah, and I think you're going to walk us through why Stardog, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there today. Uh, there's even a whole other cottage industry of added things to, to graph. And what I know about Stardog uh, is that it's, it's not just the database or even just a, a workbench on top of it actually has a whole lot of functionality to it. We're going to kind of focus on this one idea that I think is going to be a game changer for Stardog in 2022. And that's around this concept of accelerating the data lake. And what is a data lake? I so, swear he didn't pay me to say that. I, I just want to make sure you all understand what a data lake is. <laughs> so we view the data lake as uh, anything that provides a horizontal layer of co-locating data for larger processing activities. Uh, if you have um, a lake with thousands of databases, we're probably talking tens of thousands or more uh, tables. So how do we just get our arms around that? Relational systems, those are a lot of fun up until the first release. If you have a clean slate and you're just making tables and pressing publish and go, then you can get a lot done pretty quickly with all the tools out there for them. Mm -hmm. However, once you have multiple databases or even multiple versions of the same database and questions about how the data that you might have defined in one schema relates to data in another schema and how you're going to start joining this data across them, that's where the cost, the manual coding, and the efforts are just not in the right spot. And this is the this is the area that we want to solve the start dog. What we talk about today. So, if we're looking at this image that you have on the screen, is this all start dog, or is start dog just that middle layer that's highlighted? This is to introduce the data fabric. Where does start dog sit? It it sits in this data fabric platform, which you could have it solely within the semantic layer. There's a cache capability that could be also used, but there's nothing else about co-location, meaning putting everything in the data lake that's going to connect the data. We still have to do something. Uh, we want to accelerate that process. We're going to take this idea of elevating data up this stack, and we're going to kind of focus in on that as the, the problem that we're going to solve today. So we're going to use Databricks and, and a test environment I have as our particular environment. Our customers, from the legacy perspective, will start following this chain up. And what Stardog wants to do is interject, uh, basically starting with the data lake storage and mm. that warehouse. Mm. And okay. So if I'm a data scientist and I need to, you know, normalize things and make them digestible to my to my stakeholders, uh, that is something that. I, I've said this a few times in, in various videos and in conferences. It's the data therapist a little bit, right? Like you kind of have to sit down, ask, you know, what data is the most important? You have this giant data, like what's important in there? I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but what about your use case, right? And that's where you have to sit down with your stakeholders and say, okay, if I need to find out what is the more likely um, information that is going to help someone make a decision, whether it's mechanical or shipping or product? It all needs to come from certain features in your data. And what you're right. saying here is you need to connect those together to make 
a story, a narrative for your stakeholder to understand. So it sounds like that is something that, you know, graphs have been used more regularly for is 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 creating um, an actual data model from the narrative that your your stakeholder will have. They don't need to know data. They don't they don't need to know graph. That's 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 what we're here for. <laughs> right. A absolutely true. And it's actually that one of the first steps uh, we execute when we start engagement is asking those stakeholders, what are the key entities and relationships that you use to talk about information within your process? Mm -hmm. And I say information in, and you know, I'm sorry for bringing this up, but your your enterprise architecture, right? Your mm -hmm. uh, information model, so you, you know, data model, and above that, information model feeds, mm -hmm. hopefully, a business process model. And so, most of the time, the stakeholders will be at that business process level, right? Uh, this example came with three different pieces of data. And this is a kind of uh, IT device usage use case on who is using which uh, particular smartphone and how much are they using it. You know, this is within Stardog Studio. We're looking at the data sources configuration, and we've got all these different connector types. And essentially what's going to happen is when we give Stardog a data source, we can then create a virtual graph. And when we answer a graph query, if any parts of that graph query could be satisfied by that virtual graph definition, then Stardog will rewrite the query and send that query to the far end. And so that might take a graph query and rewrite to SQL, in this case, Spark SQL. Uh, it could rewrite it to the MongoDB query language or so on. So within Studio, uh, identify which schemas that we're gonna look at. Uh, there's also the ability to configure connection pools, so much like you'd have any other Java-based uh, application, there's connection pools and the ability to provide vendor specific properties. Save this, this is gonna load things up. You can see I've got a whole bunch of different virtual graphs against uh, different uh, data sets. So if I do create virtual graph, I can select my data source and I can click this generate mappings button. But we can kind of see that there's this default URI prefix and then every column within the, that target table uh, turns into an edge in our graph. And I made just a couple edits here to introduce some some types and some edge names that are a little bit easier to use. So when I've got a, a virtual graph, uh, something in a data source I'm not familiar with, I am going to uh, run kind of just a, a little sanity check query. And you can see here we've got this virtual devices name. So devices was the name of our virtual graph. And these things are called BGPs or basic graph patterns. They essentially uh, provide a series of matching expressions that Stardog is going to try and match against that far end. In this case, it'll match everything. And I give myself a limit. I don't want the entire database coming back in my query. So just, just a little taste of five, five uh, uh, result solutions coming back. And I can kind of see here, all right, I've got ooh, device and marketing name and model. They all kind of look the same. And so my next query might be to uh, look at the device record. And I just copied these from my uh, virtual graph mapping. So that's one of the nice things about that virtual graph mapping. The language is the same as the query language. So I can just grab my BGPs from one and reuse it another. Mm -hmm. Again, a step that ideally uh, Going into 2022, people can do from a visual tooling perspective, but uh, from here, it's pretty straightforward. Well, before and, we move on to that, so when you're doing the, that mapping, is that something, it looked like Stardog was doing a lot of that in an automated fashion. What if it gets an error in that test that you did? Is it pretty easy to correct or to manually map if you know what needs to be corrected? Yes, the mapping, essentially takes a from statement, so from like a SQL query, and then to uh, a series of patterns and what it wants to look like. Mm -hmm. And when we generate the virtual graph mapping, uh, Star Starlog is essentially going to use the JDBC metadata API to inspect the far end schema and say, okay, tell me everything you know about this schema, and I'm gonna go in and every table turns into a mapping definition. Mm, take the mm. 
take the table name, we make it a class name, we take the primary key, we make that. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Okay. It makes more sense. And, and we can see here that we took the columns and we made those edges in our graph. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these BGPs essentially say, okay, you know, something is a type of device record that something is going to have a device, a marketing name, a model, a retail branding. Uh, you'll notice there is one prefix here that I've defined for the default. Um, so dealing with the URIs commonly present in RDF systems is something that Starlog simplifies mm -hmm. uh, a lot. Okay, I did a mapping uh, against some data. I'm not really 100% familiar with the data, but let me just kind of see what that looks like. And I start to make observations like, okay, I see retail branding is often the same. I'm looking at model and device. And so now I'm kind of thinking, all right, I can get part of the way by joining on use ID. And so my next query is to now start knitting these together in the graph. So essentially what you're doing right now for it, for the audience is you're you're taking that core data set that you already had that you knew had the components that you needed and now you're going through each of these queries to understand how to join them together or to relate them together in your model so that it will be more effective to answering your question is that accurate That that's correct and I okay. I didn't have to take out my SQL cheat sheet and th and think yeah. about Am I left joining, inner joining, outer joining? Which <laughs> diagram going? I'm just trying to go from, from edge to edge. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to walk through this query just a little bit to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about the graph queries is you can kind of almost read them as sentences. And mm -hmm. so you can kind of see here that I have joined user device to usage record and user device to device. Mm -hmm. And now so I'm you're, you're creating that triple, right? And again, for the audience, those relations that he's talking about right here, like has device record, that was coming from your original data source where it was looking at the column names and, and putting it in as, as relations, i.e. the edge, correct? That's okay. correct. Cool. I'm translating as we go. No, I appreciate it. So this kind of gives me a whole bunch of information and I could save this to a file one of the neat things is if I store this query, discovery joins as a mm -hmm. stored query. So within Stardog, the BI SQL Server endpoint, we've talked a lot about taking graph and using a mapping to get data out of relational systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of, you know, tilt your head sideways and, and see that one of our core technologies is about rewriting graph answering from one aspect to another. So we went from graph to relational. What if we flip that upside down and went from relational uh, to graph? And so that would be basically something very similar. Yeah. And there are a couple of key ways that happens. One way is that by saving a query, it's going to make that saved query a table name uh, mm -hmm. for at the BI layer. So Stardog is uh, wire compatible with MySQL. You can use any MySQL driver with it. Mm -hmm. And so now I've got a table effectively called discovery joins. Mm -hmm. And you might say, what are the columns in your table? Well, my columns in the table are just as they appear in my results set. I've got user device, device record, marketing name, and so on. Mm -hmm. The other way that we get stuff into that layer is uh, some of the classes. So you, you notice that I put some class names on there like mm -hmm. usage and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that will give us um, actual tables that follow the ontology or the graph model. So if you say this thing is a class, maybe I have some properties mm -hmm. that uh, things, you know, use this class from. Where do you define, for this, have you already, um, did Stardog create an automatic ontology based on the data set that you created and then made the edges and, and the nodes? Or is there an ontology somewhere else that you have to set up beforehand? So because we use the automatic generation, implicitly we started creating class and edge definitions. I got so you. so for this one, it was automated. Yes, this gave us our kind of first little taste into defining some edges and defining mm -hmm. some classes, again, based off of the table names. Mm -hmm. We could very easily, within that mapping file, mm -hmm. use other classes or edges defined by other ontologies. Okay, and perfect. That's where I was getting at. Okay, cool, cool, cool. 
and a key differentiator of Stardog is that we fully implement the OWL2 spec, which means we can lean on the inference engine to uh, help with that reshaping and recontextualizing of the data. Mm -hmm. So if I say device is type um, part and part is a product and so on, I ask for all products. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't need my data to have anything about products. If I have those couple ontology statements, mm -hmm. Stardog is going to, again, rewrite the query yeah. when reasoning is on. So here we are with that key idea again about query yep. writing. Yep. So we're going to rewrite the query to answer uh, with reasoning. And we can do that over uh, the ontology or model itself, which are just mm -hmm. triples, or we can mm -hmm. add data or both. And you know, we're full supporters. You can use uh, RDF Star and Sparkle Star in Stardog. You can use it in virtual graphs. Uh, more feature support is coming across the feature matrix on supporting the edge properties. All right, so uh, we have our sanity query and a number of discovery queries. The last one was starting to go hop by hop in the graph and mm -hmm. starting to put the joints together, which at this point with our limited data set and effectively having three tables and three node types, we have gone and joined all the data. Uh, in a uh, larger scenario, we might have, you know, many more of this, in which case, you know, I might have a lot of different discovery queries, kind of like joining a couple of things here and a couple of things mm -hmm. there. Just yeah, again, Right. Uh, but with this, I'm starting to feel relatively comfortable so I can uh, start answering some of my business questions, which is uh, which models uh, had the most uh, usage. And if we see here, essentially, I basically took the previous query and now I'm just looking for model. I grouped by that and did a count. And that gives me some information. I didn't put in an ordering on it or anything else like that. Um, so, uh, from here, I could do a couple of things, right? I could save this report as a saved query. I could bring it into Tableau. Instead, I'm going to use Stardog Studio's visualization. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this one, oh, this one's by branding. Uh, mm -hmm. But here I've got uh, by branding. So, um, this one does fit on the screen. We see there's uh, some different options here. Mm -hmm. Just by clicking this charts, uh, this brings up an interface, and you can see here it, it takes a little bit of a guess on what you want. So I've got yeah. uh, count on the top and uh, the branding on the bottom, but I'm going to change this uh, to a density one, and I'm going to change uh, the y-axis to the count, and increase this a little bit so you can kind of get some better perspective and this is essentially where uh where we're winding up right so we did our query we have our joins this is all virtual it just talked to databricks i have some tools here to manipulate it I think like this lets me take a picture uh oh you can also do it in 3d and some other stuff uh, so this is a, a great library that uh, we found integrated into Studio and mm -hmm. has a whole bunch of options for charts and browsing data and, and so on. Yeah, I, I can so, imagine the 3D is maybe helpful if you're looking at like a network in your graph or something like that. Yeah. Right. I am glad you so, didn't start with that. That's what everyone starts with. But you actually gave the answer to your business problem, which is way more important than the hairball. <laughs> absolutely. And, and that was... Uh, essentially what I wanted to show today was mm -hmm. a use case that many people are given. Here is a pile of data. Go make sense of it and then answer my question. And we want to be able to uh, repeat this cycle as easily and as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is me taking my time kind of, you know, walking through my process of well, first I do my sanity check and then I write some discovery queries and I do some joins um, using upcoming tools for the, the visual uh, mapping. Mm -hmm. This will be like a, a cycle executed in minutes, right? Nice. It's even this, um, you know, getting this set up, right? Like I need to know how to, to add the data bricks as a virtual graph source and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Usually that's a one-time tax, but once you have 
once you have that semantic layer over your existing data sources, mm -hmm. like or not, uh, you have the ability to start executing these types, mm -hmm. uh, reshaping the data, mm -hmm. contextualize it a little bit, and then answer that question.